afternoon, everyone. Wait, wait, espera, ya. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our first session of Parenting in Quarantine. Uh, happy to have you all here with us today. Today we're going to be talking about uh, avoiding this behavior. But but first, uh, we want to remind you how to how can you access this meeting every Thursday directly from the from the counselor site. Uh, just put on the Google search Met Counselors website and it takes you directly to our to our website and here in the uh in the main page you can access directly to this button here that says google okay also you can access past sessions in the bottom part of the of the website you can access all the resources we've been uploading uh for the past weeks about our previous session okay yeah. So, um, today we're talking about behavior, and this is one of, of the biggest challenges parents face. And, and, you know, managing difficult or defiant behavior can be very challenging. Uh, but first, we need to define what is a uh, child misbehavior, right? So misbehavior is a behavior that doesn't con coincide with some expectations determined by the child's environment. The idea of misbehavior requires an explicit or implicit agreement of the desired behavior. Some behaviors are universally inappropriate, such as eating, speaking, eating, and some are defined as adequate in a social group. So, uh, Misbehavior might might look different in each family, so it, it uh, and it's related to the agreements and rules that each family uh, settles. So, whether they're refusing to put on their shoes or throwing a full blown tantrum, you can find uh, yourself at a loss for an effective way to respond. But we have to keep in mind that if you want to change a child's behavior, you must connect before you can correct. And this core principle of positive discipline uh, is just brain science. Children learn and grow and feel safe and thrive uh, best when they feel connection. Sometimes we have to stop dealing with the misbehavior and, and, and first heal the relationship. Connection creates a sense of safety and openness. Uh, punishment, lecturing, nagging, blaming, or shaming just create fight or flight or freeze reactions. Uh, one of my favorite examples is uh, I love you, and the answer is no. Uh, because this also illustrates uh, one of, of the positive disciplines concept of kind and firm at the same time. Okay, sometimes we, we think that they, they can't, cannot go together, but yes, we can be kind and firm at the, at the same time. I want to clarify that rescuing, fixing, and overprotection are not good ways to establish connection. Uh, effective connections are made when both the child and the adult feel belonging and significance. In order to make connection, uh, we need to keep in mind that uh, there might be four goals in misbehavior. Uh, once we understand what the behavior is trying to tell us, then we can approach the child in a more empathetic way. And after all, empathy is fundamental to establish connection. So we're going to discuss these four goals in a more detailed way through this chart here. Uh, where we can see what the child is actually needing, how 
you might feel when you're subjected to this behavior, how, should, uh, how your child might act or respond to your correction, and the positive ways to respond. For example, attention, okay? Uh, the goal for misbehavior might be seeking for attention. So what the child is actually needing might be contact or a sense of belonging, okay? Physical or emotional contact with other human beings. This might trigger in you like a sense of annoyment or irritation, okay? And you might respond with, for example, would you knock it off? Uh, leave me alone, stay away, things like that. Uh, how your child may act or respond to correction will stop behavior when, when you say things like, like, like this, it, the behavior might stop, but it might start again very soon. A positive way to respond uh, could be ignore that the behavior that the child is using to call for attention and give full attention at other times and, and try to engage in a positive interaction with the child. Just acting, not necessarily talking. Um, so children are dependent on us, adults, they need our attention, their survival depends on it, okay? Most children, at least most of the time, find positive ways to seek out the attention they need. Uh, but some children get discouraged in their efforts to get what they need physically and emotionally. And then the adults get overwhelmed by whatever is overwhel overwhelming the child. Uh, but it doesn't have to be like that all the time, okay? And today we're going to be discussing uh, effective ways to uh, avoid misbehaviors. And now Ms. Roxana is going to share with us some of these strategies. Hello, parents and everyone. Good afternoon to all. Well, um, we're going to share some strategies, but there could be many more. It's not close to this, so these are just some ideas. The first one, as Ms. Batista, well, of course, some strategies are, we already talked about them in our previous webinars, such as having a structure and consistent routines that helps um, our children to feel safe in their environment, and it decreases the 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 amount of misbehaviors that they show then we have staying positive ourselves and work on your emotional well-being well and also have one-on-one -on -one time with your child so you can review our previous uh, presentations in our youtube channel and we also share some strategies that will help with misbehavior. The first one that we're sharing here is to connect, as Ms. Batista said, stay connected by seeing your child's point of view. And the motivation to behave comes from their connection with you. Reestablish that connection before you can influence their behavior. That was what she was saying about connecting before correcting. And here is one example. As soon as you see your child getting upset and pushing on the limits of accepted, acceptable behavior, move in close and reconnect. For example, sweetie or whatever name your, your child has, I think we all need a hug. Come here. And then you try to, to reestablish that emotional bonding between the two of you before the situation escalates into misbehavior. Then we have redirect the behavior. You can catch, these are all strategies to prevent the misbehavior to happen. You can catch inappropriate behavior early and then redirect the child's attention to more adequate behavior in that specific situation. And you could also use play uh, or sense of humor to redirect the behavior. You need to stop it before it starts, of course, there are situations in which you can do this and others you can't. So we have strategies for all, but this one is mostly to prevent. When they start to get restless, you can distract with something interesting or fun. Come, let's play a game together. Or let's do this. Let, uh, help me uh, cook something that I'm doing in the kitchen or um, come and see something that I'm watching on my cell phone or whatever thing that you consider is appropriate in that particular moment. 
Okay, another one that is very related to connecting is help them with their emotions. So your child might misbehave because they are feeling um, angry, frustrated, sad, underneath, or even scared. And proactively helping your child to surface and express, surface those feelings and express them um, could help those feelings to decrease and they will be more calm. So for example, you can reflect explicitly the, emo explicitly the emotion and you can say, okay, I can see that you are angry right now because this and this happened, or I can see that you're frustrated and it's okay. When they become aware of their emotions are more likely to calm down. Understand their feelings. Oh, go, go back a little. Can I accept, accept accepting parents that are joining right now understanding their feelings does not imply that you accept misbehavior there's two different things it's like the the message we shared Ms. Batista shared at the beginning i love you but no you acknowledge their feelings but you still have your limits now the other side you could regulate your own emotions if you can regulate your own emotions, you can always calm the storm. And that's what teach that teaches kids to manage their own emotions because they learn more from what they see than from what they hear. They learn from both, but they learn more from what they see. Sometimes you as parents might feel like giving up, but you can take a pause for a few minutes and that has proven to um, have significant results in um, decreasing misbehavior. You may breathe in and out slowly for, I don't know, five, six, seven times, and then respond um, in a more calm way. Okay, this is something that, this is a strategy that helps once the behavior has already happened and also to prevent other misbehaviors. And it's the use of consequence. So you have um, natural and logical consequences that are things related um, directly to the behavior that happened. Consequences help to teach our children responsibility for what they do so that they learn that every action comes with a consequence. It doesn't have, to, it's not a punishment because also like positive behaviors have positive consequences as well. They also allow discipline um, that is controlled and this is more effective than heating or shouting or any more emotional reaction. Um, you give your child a choice to follow your instruction before giving them the consequence and of course you talk about this consequence if you can and if not you only reflect on the consequence after it happens because it's a natural. For example, in school or anywhere, you tell uh, children to walk on the hallways in your house, tell them to walk and they can run outside. Um, if they fall down and you weren't there, later on when they are settled, you can have a discussion about how it's important um, to walk because then they could fall down as they did and they can hurt themselves or others. Try to stay calm when giving the consequence and not having like a like an exaggerated emotional reaction. Make sure you can follow through with the consequence, not giving up. For example, taking away a teenager's phone for a week is hard to enforce. And in these times, uh, it would be almost impossible. But maybe taking it away for an hour is more realistic. So make sure that the consequences are also things that you can uh, you can follow through. Once the consequence is over, give your child a chance to do something good and praise them for it. So once it's, it's done, then you can always give them the opportunity to fix what they did or repair what they did somehow, and that will um, have an impact on their self-esteem and their self-confidence. So this... If you have, I, we knew that we, you might have a lot of questions. So we try to, we try to make it shorter so that we have more time for questions about particular situations that you're experiencing right now during the, the lockdown and the quarantine. So we open the, the chat to read your questions. Let me see.
great advice. Or maybe you you want to share with other parents some of the strategies that are working with you right now because this this situation is so new for all of us that we might be trying new strategies like never tried before and they might be working. So you may also give some ideas or tips about things that are working for you currently and that might be helpful for other parents as well. Okay, yeah, a good strategy we use in school is the take a break spot. Yes, and actually, um, well, for parents who don't know yet, take a break spot is a strategy that comes included in the responsive classroom program to manage uh, behavior and help students manage also their emotions. So within every classroom, we have a, well, we were planning to do it in every classroom. We started with some like pilot classrooms and then um, now we are at home, but you can have an area in the classroom that is called a take a break spot. And in that place, you can have um, different tools and materials that can help your child calm down whenever they are overwhelmed by their emotions. It's not, um, it's not a timeout and it can be used um, it's like a positive timeout, you could say, but it's more like uh, when children need to just relax for a while and then be ready to go back to their activities with it in the school. So, for example, if someone comes from recess, if, if a boy, a student com comes from recess and he's super excited about playing soccer and then he goes to the classroom and he's still is excited, finding it difficult to settle and um, focus on the on the classes, on their classes, he can go to the take a break spot and then just calm down from his excitement and be ready to go back. It can, it can be used for meltdowns, emotional like meltdowns or temper tantrums or when something, there was a conflict in recess or during the class day that they might feel sad or upset at a friend. So we have, I have recommended this strategy to some parents during the, the quarantine and we could also send some materials. And it has been useful for children to have that physical space to just uh, calm down from their emotions and then be ready to go back to their activities or have a conversation with their parents. So the idea is that they acknowledge their feelings first, like, okay, I'm feeling angry, I'm feeling frustrated, I'm feeling sad or overexcited. And then they use one or two strategies that they have pre-selected to calm down, such as drinking water, reading a book, uh, using a squeegee, uh, coloring or drawing or writing about their feelings or breathing, a breathing technique or whatever helps the child. And then after they try it, they reflect about their feelings again. And if they feel ready, they go back and can have a conversation with their parents. So, yeah, for, it, it's, yeah. Like a, it's like a way to make it like very concrete and the the purpose is that gradually they learn how to do it by themselves and they can use their, their strategies without needing like a, a physical space and it's like that is a skill that they that they acquire yeah we have a question here in the chat it says for small for small children, how could we explain that we parents cannot give them attention 100% of the time, particularly at this time that although we're together, parents need to work. Yes. I, well, this is uh, I can imagine that that right now that we are all together, sharing spaces and times. Uh, this might become a concern for for many so thank you for many people so thank you for this question because it might be you know shared by by a lot of people um one one of the things we and we have we talked before uh in our previous sessions about um uh sharing this quarantine together in a positive way is like establishing clear routines and structures that allow 
everybody, everyone to have their own times and spaces and also uh, times together. So um, if it's, it says if it's a young children, I, I don't know how how young might be, but if it's some if, if it's a, a, per, a child that can understand, uh, for example, that you can say uh, right now, mommy's working. You can stay here. It's it's about establishing you know clear boundaries because if we have in mind that children are seeking for attention and company. And most of the time they do it in a positive way. The, the, the thing is that when they feel that they demand and demand and they don't get what they want, it's when you know mis misbehavior or, or defiant behavior starts showing up. So it's about taking the time to let them know what's going on, why is it that I am not playing with you right now, why, why is it is that, that, that I'm not having eye contact with you right now, it's because mommy's working, I'm gonna be here, I need to work, I need to work on the computer, you can play here, you can, you can be quiet, you can establish the rules and uh, or agreements with your child, uh, the expectations, okay, because you're in, 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 in that way you can also measure what is not uh, you know, following the rule or the agreement that the the behaviors need to be uh, clearly defined, so the child can understand what is the expectation. Uh, sometimes we just ask, but you have to you have to behave. But what is behave? What is good behavior? What is misbehavior? So these things need to be clearly established with the child, and that will depend, of course, on the on their level of of understanding if it's a it's a very young child uh around i don't know two or three but they have they started having language to understand basic you know interactions you can you can talk to them and you can explain that they can play around because what they are seeking is for company so if or you can also make an agreement if, if it's an older sh child you can make an agreement and say well right now mom it's gonna work it's gonna work I'm going to work from two to three, and then after three, I am going to play with you uh, for a while. So you can also make that, that kind of agreement if, if they're older, a little bit older. I don't know if you want to add something, Roxana, to that idea. Um, you can, well, here, here is some idea about making the signs to, to use so having like a like a signal for them to let them know that in a specific amount in a specific time of the day you are working so that they can have like a visual visual aid of when you need your own time to work and when you can have time to play with them also you can go back to our presentation last week about quality time with our children so as Yanisa mentioned before, they are they are eager of attention maybe because they feel that they don't have that like quality in a relationship. And obviously, the younger the child, they they will need more attention from you. So um, there are some ideas there about how you can how can you uh, include within your daily routine some activities that will ensure quality time with your child as well. Yeah, and, and, and sometimes it's that about, talking about quality time, it's about also, you know, quality of the interaction because um, sometimes we think that if we ignore the behavior, it will disappear. Uh, but usually it doesn't. So it's it like... It escalates. Yeah, it escalates because they are, that's what they want. That's what they are demanding. So it's just like turning a couple of seconds and having a one-on-one -on -one, uh, interaction, eye contact, personalized attention, or just asking, what do you need right now? It's like, you know, helping the child to express their needs before it gets to a point in which they have to use uh, worse ways to call for attention or to express their needs. So, uh, it's also about you know the quality of the interaction and in that moment and that will save you a lot of time 
that could save you uh, many constant interruptions instead of just having one quality interaction that explains that you are busy right now and this is what I expect from you. And when I'm done with my work, I will play with you. So it's like an agreement or a commitment to, to make with a child. Um, there was another question. What will be a logical consequence for a child who doesn't want to sit down and work online during synchronous lessons because he, she prefers doing other things? Well, m my first question will be uh, helping the child to understand what, what's going on. What, what is it that it's uh, affecting uh, their engagement? I will ask him or her, like, how are you feeling right now? What is it? What do you need? Or, uh, I don't know, trying to explore uh, how, uh, if, it's, if, it's, if, if it's tired or hungry or sleepy or, I don't know, something that it might be affecting the attention that, that the student might uh, should be displaying at that moment. Uh, so that also helped the child to create awareness of their body because sometimes uh, they they feel you know different sensations and they don't know how to express their needs. So it's the first question will be, how are you feeling? Validate their their feelings and then finding a way to negotiate uh, the whatever is needed at that moment. If it's a, a connection in the synchronous lesson, the child needs to be there. Look, like, so let's try to, to make an effort to stay connected in this class. And then when you're done with it, because synchronous lessons are not too long, um, we can grab a bite of, of something or you can take a break or whatever you can uh, establish with the child as an agreement. Yeah, I would say I, I agree with, with Yanisel about um, exploring a little bit about the reason, like why is he doing that? He wants to call his friend's attention, the teacher attention, he finds the material difficult, he, he just can connect online, and then once you figure out that, one logical consequence, and this is only an option that must not apply to every child, but only one idea is, um, okay, First, what activities is he or she doing to avoid the, the lesson? And then you can say, well, the time that you are using, that you're not using for your meeting, maybe you need to use it later in the day. When it's time to play, maybe we need to sit down and finish whatever assignment you were supposed to complete during the meeting. So that would be like a logical consequences, be, consequences because you're using the time of the meeting to do something else then maybe later when it's time to play or to do something more relaxing, you will need to like redo that activity or complete that activity. So you can you can uh, say your you can tell your child that they need to use their time wisely, and if they want the afternoon to do other things, then they need to respect the teachers and their classmates' time when they have the meetings. So that, that is one idea. Mm -hmm. But but I would start with exploring the reasons why if it's it will depend. I mean, if if he wants to call his friend's attention, okay, what happened with your friends? Are you missing your friends? And maybe we can plan some play dates with your friends so that you can interact with them in a more uh, fun way, let's say, or if you want to um, call your teacher's attention, okay, what's going on with the teacher? Maybe we have a meeting with a, with your teacher and figure out what happens. So it depends. That That is a, only a behavior that is on the surface, but there m might be like infinity of, of reasons underneath that, that are causing that, that behavior. Mm hmm um there's another question what is the best strategy against heating heating uh if the child is hitting another child and it's it's hitting the the adults uh well in case 
in, in I don't know if, if, if Ms. Castro can clarify uh, what the age of the child, it depends on the on the age. Uh-huh, uh -huh. hitting, hitting the parent, hitting the parent, yeah. Um, so sometimes young children hit because uh, they don't know how to express, yeah, okay, she's five. They don't know how to express uh, what they're feeling, how to put that in, in words. So uh, the, the first thing to say is to, to, to stop the behavior and saying, I, I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not allowing you to hit me, that's not right. Uh, and then putting some distance between you and the child. Uh, do not grab them because uh, that will escalate, you know, the, if, if the child feels that, that you are um, trying to control their body, they are not gonna respond. Uh, they're gonna respond with more force uh, backwards. So I will say, put your put some distance between you and the child, and use your words to express that that's not right. That you're not gonna tolerate that behavior, and that you can understand that she might be feeling uh, um, sad or frustrated or whatever. You know the the antecedent situation. Uh, usually something happened that triggered that behavior. So you can use that information to help help them uh, uh, in, uh, translate what they are what they are feeling. So you can say, I can see you can you are frustrated, uh, but hitting is not the way we solve problems in this family. And I'm not gonna tolerate that. So when you calm down, we're gonna talk about it. So you have to stop the behavior immediately, either by stepping back, creating, putting some distance between you and her, and then using your words to translate the emotion. That uh, because she's using the hitting to to express her uh, her frustration. So it's helping her. So you can be the translate the emotional translator of, of what she might be feeling at that moment. Uh, at that age, you can say, you can simply say, as as Yanisel said, um, like establish a limit and you can simply say no, like very firm and say, no, this is not okay. And then um, one, once you are like uh, exploring her feelings, you can encourage her to use her words and you can say that a simple, simple phrase like, use your words, no hitting, use your words. So it's okay to be upset, it's okay to be angry, you can be upset at me. And this is a conversation you have once the, your, your daughter is calmed down. So when she's in the moment, when she's in the tantrum or when she's very angry, you can tell her like, no, this is not okay, very firm and give a distance for her to calm down. And once it has happened, explore her feelings, reassure that it's okay to feel upset, that she, can be upset at you, but hitting is a no-no and she can use her words. And then you can even practice or you can model with her. And you, in that, in that case, you can tell her like, I feel very sad when you hit me and, but I'm not, but, and that is, that is not appropriate. So next time, please use your words and we don't hit. So very simple for a five-year-old like use your words no hitting and then and ex and sort of reflecting her behavior and letting her letting her know that, that not her behavior her feelings and letting her know that those feelings are okay but her reaction is not okay and it's and it's unacceptable and yes. then always reinforce like use use your words whenever you are feeling upset you can always use your words how are you feeling? Are you feeling sad? Are you feeling frustrated? Are you feeling scared? Are you feeling angry? Very, very concrete at that age. Yeah, and, and something you said, Roxana, that is very important is that we have to wait for the tantrum to be over to have these conversations. Remember that when, when, when um, we don't expect children to, to get engaged in conversations to process their feelings or emotions. When even, they, even us as adults, when we are upset, we are not able to talk. Exactly. So we give you them know, to calm down, and then you talk to them, then you 
find solutions with them. If, if they're a little bit older, you can, after after the episode of you know frustration or anger, you can talk to them and you can focus on solutions with them. That this is a really important part of the of the process of uh making changes or promoting changes uh in terms of behavior uh sometimes we have like you know established patterns of interaction in our homes and but there's always uh, different ways to 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 solve problems so uh if if you want to try these strategies of course at the beginning your child is going to be like what's the matter with mom or with dad? Uh, what's what happened here? Because she or he is reacting in a different way. But, you know, if you keep trying and you keep showing and modeling assertive ways to solve conflict, they will feel more secure, they will feel protected, and they will respond in a positive way to that. So eventually the behavior will start changing and you will, you will start seeing less and less episodes of, of misbehavior because they will use their words and they will express what they need. Remember behavior, it's a way of expressing our needs. We, we uh, children usually express their needs through behavior. So every behavior means something. That's how we create that empathy that we were talking before. It's about understanding what is that she or he might be needing at this moment. And if you have no idea because you were not there or you just arrived home and uh, there's a major conflict going on be between siblings or whatever, you just encourage them to calm down and to talk when they are uh, able to do it like in a in a calmer way not not without screaming or yelling because that those uh, are not appropriate ways to communicate and you, you cannot convey a clear message when you are screaming or yelling or, or shouting or or crying so and it's not about and we, we were saying last week that's not about uh, avoid uh, telling them to to not not to cry because Crying is also a way of expressing what they need. So you can let them cry, and then when they calm down, they can tell you what is that that they need. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. So, so, mm -hmm. can, you want to you translate it? Uh, what can we do with the guilt when we have done it wrong? Sometimes I want to cry because in the... In a moment, I lose control. I don't know if this is worse or better. Well, um, uh, we talked about guilt that last week, right? That we can feel guilt about uh, the way we are dealing with the situations. And right now, uh, we are living through uh, special times in which uh, every situation, even the tiniest, the tiniest ones, uh, might seem very demanding. So uh, being a good parent is all, it's about asking yourself, uh, am I doing it right? How can I do it better? Finding ways to improve yourself and also accepting that you are a human being and that you can make mistakes and you have a, your own emotions and sometimes you lose it because you are dealing with so many things, uh, with the parenting and the working and the home chores and so many things together. Uh, so the first thing I will say, Ms. Ma Ms. Martinez, is to validate your own feelings and and accept that you are trying to do the best you can because you love your children. And uh, of course, sometimes we lose control. What can I do next time to make it to manage in a better or a more positive way? Uh, and crying, it's okay. Crying, if you feel that you want to cry. Crying because that's the way we. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm gonna say this in Spanish. I don't know how to say that in English. Las lágrimas en Juan el alma. Sometimes we just we just need to cry because that's the way we drain everything and then we we're ready to move on. Um, and also, 
express to your children how are you feeling with the situation and and if you feel that you cross the line and you you uh, overreacted you can also go back and say and talk to them and and, and apologize and say hey i'm sorry uh, i i think i overreacted for this or i um i cross the line but sometimes i feel and then you talk about what you are feeling that is a very very powerful message for your child for your children to understand that mom and dad also have feelings and they react to to what's going on uh, in our surroundings so be honest be open with them talk about what they're what what are you feeling and if you need to apologize that that's okay because we're also modeling that we make mistakes and we we reflect and we find ways to make it work. You can also ask, um, what can we do together? You encourage them to participate as part of the solution. What can we do next time if, if something like this happens? How can we manage this situation? Can you give me some ideas? I don't know, like involving them, making them, uh, inviting them to be part of the solution rather than be part of the problem. Okay. Any questions? <laughs> I don't know if, if someone wants to share it through the uh, actually, share. actually, one of one of the strategies that we presented today was to become aware of your own emotions. And as we are saying that we need to reinforce our children that it's okay for them to be upset and it's okay for them to be sad. It's okay for everyone to feel freely. So um it's there it's fake to hide our emotions from our children so i would say that they appreciate more natural responses of course you need to find also ways to calm down the same the same strategies that we are uh talking about for our children can also be useful for us as adults as well um because we have learned how to do it in our development but what we are experiencing today is a once in a lifetime situation and we might go back to our childhood reactions let's say sometimes this this can be triggering things uh within us that that were already like that we already overcome and um it's okay but as jenny Sell said the first step is to become aware and then when you are aware guilt is a natural reaction but it's useless so you can experience it and then notice that there is a way out there is a solution and that you can figure it out with with your family with our support with a friend support someone like we are creating a community right now and there is always someone that you can talk to so no no one is alone in this right now yeah and uh, and love is a is super powerful uh, i mean like um how many times your children have heard you in different ways saying mean things and uh, you know uh and then they come back and apologize and say i'm sorry and and that's the way we 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 teach them we teach them that we make mistakes and we we apologize for that and nothing that a hog cannot heal so that's all, always a good way to seal a good deal with a with a big hug and, and tell as, we were, as we were saying for children like giving we want to give them what when using consequences we want to give them the opportunity to repair give yourselves also an opportunity to repair and move on because staying like in circles with something that already happened will only make you feel worse and you mm -hmm. also you can also um be um how do you say like uh you can also have the chance to repair your own behaviors like we like they they do so yeah. i don't know if you have any more questions or you want to comment on, so, or on something that you're that you're doing at home and it has been useful Parents have great ideas. Some of the things that I that I do in counseling for for students, some of them come from parents' ideas, and I ask 
them and their children. Can I do this with other students? Because this is great. So maybe sharing some of the things that you're doing can help other parents find different ways to manage with certain behaviors. Yeah. Um, I want to, I, I would like to uh, wrap up with, with the, something called the ABC of behavior management at home. Uh, it's, it's about understanding and responding effectively to, to 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 what we just discussed today. You know, problematic behaviors and A goes for the antecedents, like preceding factors that make a behavior more or less likely to occur. So uh, it's like uh, identifying the triggers. Okay, uh, and if you don't know what was the trigger, you can always ask the child. They usually. Uh, sometimes they don't know in the moment, but if you give them the time to explore a little bit with awareness, what, what is it that they're feeling, they can go to that to that point. Then the B goes for behavior, the specific actions you are trying to encourage or discourage. And then C is for consequences. Uh, of course, as Roxana mentioned, we encourage logical consequences. And consequences can be positive or negative and they affect uh, um the behavior they they prevent from recurring behaviors okay they, they they that's what we want with the consequence we want the child to understand that if if they keep doing this this will keep happening and if it's unpleasant they will try to avoid it next time okay remember that behaviors need to be clearly defined okay it's not just about portate bien Okay, good behavior, bad behavior. It, it needs to be clearly defined. What are the expectations in your family? Remember, as we said at the beginning, misbehavior might be might look like this in one family, it might look like that in another family. So it's important to define with your children and make agreements with your partner on how to manage discipline at home. There, there are some comments here. Um, Patricia is, is sharing. I found the color bracelet a very good way to seal our agreements. And both my kid and myself have a reminder. Actually, we need to implement it again now. And this is, this is one of the strategies that I really love. And I recommend it for other students. You can have like different, um, say, how do you say, hilos? Threads. Um, yeah, like, like you can make a bracelet with different colors and every color uh, has a meaning. Like red is a reminder that your mom loves you and green is a reminder that you can solve problems by using Kelso's choices or, and then, and it's free. So they can keep that uh, bracelet and they can even like use it all the time. And they have that reminder of these particular things that you want them to keep in mind. So this, this was an idea from Patricia uh, a year ago, and it was very useful, and, and I recommended it for other students. So if you, yeah, it's, <laughs> if you it's really nice and lovely. Yeah. Yeah. And then Ms. Manzanares mentioned, um, our children don't come with a manual of instructions. Parents learn uh, as, we, as we raise them. So the important thing is that they know that we correct them with love. So keep it up. Thank you for this lovely message. Yeah, and thank you for joining us today. We're almost uh, running out of time. We appreciate your company today. It was uh, nice talking to you. Remember that our resources are uploaded in the, in the website and also the videos can be accessed uh, through the MET YouTube channel. So if you please help us spread the word with other parents that are not maybe uh, it's difficult for them to attend at this time. Uh, we appreciate you spreading the words with other parents because we've been preparing all these resources with, with love and with you in mind thinking how can we help you even though we're not you know, available as we used to be before in our, with our offices doors open. We are, we are still here for you and whatever you need, please do not hesitate to let us know and contact us. Mm -hmm. So see you next Thursday. We'll be posting the, the topic for next webinar on the, um, by mail and on Instagram, on the Met Instagram account. So stay tuned. 
and see you next Thursday. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you for Bye.